discuss the long and short of wealth management. So that's the topic. And I'm Sankalp and I take care of business development at PMS AIF World. And as most of you are familiar with what we do, but I'll still give a little bit of introduction to what we do. We're trying to, you know, we stand for investing. And as you would notice, most of our efforts and all our sessions are focused and concentrated in that endeavor. Uh, in 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 in, a, in keeping in uh, congruence with our rich tradition of uh, investor uh, centric approach, we are coming with a mid year conclave on the 9th and 10th of July. And I think this is a good medium to uh, extend a warm welcome to today's audience and to everybody listening on the call today and who will listen to this afterwards on YouTube. Uh, we are hosting the top investment managers confluence on the 9th and 10th of July. And uh, this is going to be a show where we answer real question. Uh, you know, we provide relatable solutions and we look at what is happening in the world of investments and what investors can expect. So now coming to today's show. So our guests uh, are today Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Satish Menon, uh, Mr. Vikas M. Sajdeva and Mr. Sachin Shah. So Satish Menon is an industry veteran, although that word is often used too loosely in the industry today or very liberally in the world today. But Mr. Satish Menon is truly a veteran and has a lot of uh, in-depth uh, understanding and uh, knowledge of the wealth management industry. Uh, Mr. Um, Menon holds a BCom degree from University of Mumbai and is a qualified, uh, you know, cost, uh, you know, uh, cost and works accountant and a certified financial planner. He has been associated with uh, GOG Financial Services since 1999 and currently serves as the executive director, which he as you the a post he, uh, you know, joined in 2011. Uh, he brings a lot of laurels, a lot of, uh, you know, industry insight and a lot of practical understanding to wealth management. Uh, our co-hosts uh, or our, uh, you know, for the day are Mr. Vikas M. Sasdeva. He also himself is an industry. Uh, Hello. So uh, he has uh, worked across AMCs and headed teams uh, across different uh, time periods, different uh, phases of evolution of the market, and is someone of uh, uh, someone of great value to this show because he brings his anecdotes and his uh, own witty charm to the show. Uh, he's also been a member of a few SEBI committees and uh, AMFI committees as well. Uh, accompanying him is fund manager at NK. Uh, Sachin Shah, uh, he, he is, uh, you know, been managing money for a while now, almost close to two decades. And he is, uh, he is the author or he is made a framework called equal of, uh, you know, investing in companies, investing in businesses. So with that, uh, introduct with uh, those introductions, let me introduce the last uh, variable in today's equation. That's FinLearn Academy. And as you all know, the best question wins a prize from FinLearn Academy. So please keep sending us your questions. FinLearn Academy is one stop solution for learn everything stock markets. And I am sure uh, the past winners will vouch for the eff efficiency of the training. So what do you Vikas? I think I have done my bit of introductions. Uh, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Sankalpo. I think uh, judging by the registrations and judging by the uh, you know questions I've got through my DM, through my timeline, I think uh, there's a lot of interest. Uh, essentially, we'll be covering three parts. Uh, we talk, we'll talk about the broker-driven broker wealth management business, wealth management business in isolation, as well as NRIs and how they look at managing money. But before we get into that, I think as is customary, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the guest as a person, the person behind the professional. And let me tell you, it's been extremely tough to find out uh, about Satish because I keep getting just one simple thing. Satish, his superpower is that is unflappable. He doesn't lose his cool. Uh, you know, uh, he he he's very calm. He's very serene. I tried to find out from so many people that Satish, when you know, because somewhere it just got to me that there is something like you know you see the Rahul Dravid ad. He's getting angry. But Satish, I must tell you that uh, across the board, everybody talks in uh, you know, glowing terms about your ability to keep calm under the most stressful of situations. Okay, In fact, a lot of people go back a long way and say that not only have you helped them unconditionally you know, during the uh, whole broking evolution which has happened, uh, because you've been very helpful, A, and B, your knowledge of systems and processes 
at a fraternity level at a capital markets level is unparalleled yeah uh, which makes me wonder why if you can take so much of stress then why you moved out of bombay you're one of the rare professionals i've seen who's moved out of bombay i think you moved to kochi in 2013 right yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, you know uh, when i talk to satish he always tells me that this is one of the best decisions he's made uh, you know it's let him to believe that he's leading a much more calm peaceful and balanced life he spends time with his lovely family wife and son uh, satish the other thing i have heard about you two more things you have an extremely sharp memory your colleagues are actually very wary of this because you recent remember decimal points in the presentation slide which has been made to years ago so they say that it sometimes gets very difficult to talk to satish because he remembers everything last but not the least uh, this is something which made me smile uh, you know that uh, satish is one guy who can hold his drink not that he drinks too much not more than two pegs but here's the fun part he makes that he makes sure that everybody around him gets drunk okay and they have their fill so people uh, said that very nicely about you so this is this is satish menon as a person i've known satish for what close to 3 decades now Uh, we used to work together in a company a long, long time ago, and I have some very fond memories of my association with him. So, Satish, let's just deep dive now and uh, and and talk about uh, you know your uh, you have basically seen the broking industry develop from very close quarters. One might say a vantage position. You know, you you've seen it re- evolve right in front of your very eyes. Uh, take us through this entire evolution process. You know, having been there, done that, seen everything. How do you think things have changed? How do you think things have evolved? So, just a little bit before Satish, you begin, Vikas. I just asked a fun poll in how many recent web calls have we faced tech glitches? So, just to you know, just uh, for the human part of it, for errors can happen. Uh, let let me put to you the poll results. Uh, at least sixty percent said that they experienced glitches in twenty to fifty percent of the last ten webinars. So, that, let's just you know set the context and begin. Glitches are glitches happen. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Sankar. So, so, so it makes me less guilty. <laughs> thank you, thank you, and thank you, Vikas, for those kind words. Uh, we have known each other for a long time now. So, in the broking industry, uh, oh, phenomenal changes have happened in the last three decades. I had come to this industry uh, somewhere in 1990, uh, if I remember right, maybe August 1990, and the Sensex was around. Uh, 1000 odd levels today it is 53 54000 so that is the kind of change i have seen i i don't know whether it proportionates to my weight <laughs> so leave that apart so i have seen uh, huge changes as per, as well as the appreciation in prices so leave apart the appreciation in prices which we will talk if if uh, some relevant question comes up but um, uh, because you would know that you have been in this industry for quite a long time in those times you know you had this trading for 2 hours 12 o'clock to 2 o'clock you know people uh, people used to go to the ring of the bombay stock exchange and used to do buy and sell physically so 12 to 2 after that you had a party so you work only for 2 hours in a day so that went on till see 95 96 uh, 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 bsc sensex 1000 the volumes were hardly 200 300 crores even if i don't know whether it was that that time today it is we are talking about 75000 crores in the cash market another 15 15 20 lakh crores in the fndo forget about that the main problem that time was uh, the physical shares mm. and this physical trading i don't think india would have reached the situation of uh, so much kind of daily volume if two institutions were not there One is NSC, which started this screen-based trading, and other is NSDL, which started this depository yes. segment. Because of these two things, the Indian capital market changed rapidly, and the number of people participating in this market went up. Those years in 1990, we had three or four people going into the ring to buy and sell shares, and we had 30, 40 people in the back office to sort out the delivery problems. It was very less efficient. more people getting into uh, uh, maybe less productive work and only four or five getting into productive work where we will generate uh, deals today the things have changed you have 10 15 people doing the dealing portion and maybe one or half of a person doing the back office that is the biggest boom which india has got over the last 25 years post msc and msdl coming and that is why you see 
even in the remote part of this country, people are able to participate in the stock market. Of course, we had our ups and downs. Mm -hmm. Every year, we see some kind of, uh, uh, not every year, every decade, some kind of scam coming in, going up. Uh, people lose focus, people lose uh, courage. All those things happen. But it is good to say that 1,000 sensex of 1990, today is 53,000, which is 14% CAGR, excluding the dividends. So no matter what happens, no matter what kind of noise happens over, over, over uh, what all wrong things are happening in this market, if you are a patient investor, you'll make money. So that is what... Uh, 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 that is what how it has evolved over the last 30 years and of course many things are happening these days uh, many things the regulator is trying to make it more st uh, stronger more secure and i think that is better for the investing community as a lot which you know you mentioned about scam you mentioned about every decade uh, interestingly one of the uh, favorite topics people talk to me now people who are uninitiated or less initiated in the stock markets is this whole scam 92 web series which has caught fire and it makes me wonder that whenever people talk about the stock market, people who don't really know the power of the stock market, they actually talk about the exceptions to the rule. You know, not the one to 53,000 sensex, thousand to 53,000 sensex, but they talk about scams which have affected. And the general feeling is that uh, this is a gambling den and one should not enter even today. Do you think that uh, there is a case for highlighting more of the positives of the stock market and then thereby having more people come in and liking broking products? Uh, let us rephrase this broking product to investment products. Okay. Uh, so that's a better term. Point taken. You know, uh, um, because when we joined this industry, or when I joined in 1990, you know, uh, brokerage was a taboo. Hmm. Uh, 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 somebody from good family do not get into broking. In Hindi, you used to call dalal. It was not something which uh, uh, a professional would go and join. Because everybody thought that it's a satta bazaar or for those uh, in English, a gambling den. Okay, so there were some elements that time. There are some elements this time also. But the market has vastly, vastly improved. You had scams, 1992. I went through it. And let me tell you, after looking at the series, I can relate to certain people because we knew those people. It happened. You had, you had a scam in 2001. So you had you had different different scams, but a different type of scam, not the similar scam which happened earlier. So people are also innovative. No matter what happens, no matter what happens, because these kind of uh, uh, incidents or episodes would be there in all industries. True. You you cannot you cannot blatantly because of one or two episodes, you cannot you cannot paint the whole industry as bad. Like I told you, 1,000 has become 53,000, which means people have made 14, 14% CHER. For what, what do you need? You don't need to go into, you don't need to get into scams for that. You don't need to, you don't need to buy, I don't want to name stocks, uh, which in .com was this much and now in this much. No, you don't need to buy that. Even if you had bought the 30 top companies of India, you would have made 14% return. The scams come from the greed of the people. Okay, people lose not because, not because uh, uh, there's a of course there's a scam going. Somebody has rigged up the price. All those things could happen, but that is a very, very limited element of people. Most of the people feel uh, think uh, most of the people feel wrong about this industry is they think it is fully gambling. No, it is not. It is the best instrument to beat your inflation. It is the best instrument to meet your goals. Because today, investing in FD or similar kind of debt instrument doesn't even take care of inflation. So if you have a discipline, if you have the right way of investment, I think this is the best investment opportunities. Not only over the stock market, you can invest in mutual fund also. So the taboo, I think the time has come that people don't look at this brokerage industry as a bad industry. It is actually good. It actually fuels in money for the economy. When the market is good, many people come out with IPOs, production can go up, economy can go up, GDP can go up. So I think this is the barometer of the country in terms of economic indices. And we should look at it that way. Few elements here and there should not dampen the spirit of this industry. I think that's very valid. So two points that you mentioned, don't talk brokerage, talk investment products. I think that's a very 
significant sort of uh, difference which you talked about most people don't realize that and second thing you mentioned about people losing money due to greed not due to the markets i think that's it's very well put sachin i'm sure you're itching to ask some questions sure sure yeah it's been a nice discussion uh, thank you satish thank you for being with us uh you know satish one interesting thing as we are talking about how markets have evolved in the last uh, since 1990 and now uh, but you know in the recent past what we see is an emergence of uh, you know technology driven broking platforms and of course they have attracted a, a swath of new investors in fact i almost call them they are like invisible investors as compared to the the traditional broking uh, houses like ours where we have a full fledged service advisory and where we are daily in touch with our investors uh they are i mean uh, this new new technology platforms uh, broking platforms have a different set of investors how how are you seeing this space actually evolving so uh sachin thank you um yes over the last 2 uh, 3 years we have seen uh, the technology based company coming into the brokerage uh, industry and they have been able to attract traction in terms of new clients and i understand from these uh, uh, new entrants that most of these new clients are of the young population that is below 25 below 30 years of age the millennials Mil- uh, uh, maybe after millennials okay. also it is a very good thing which is happening in india you know uh, uh, maybe maybe 5 years back the total number of individual who used to trade in the stock market when you look at msc once in a year the number would have been i don't know maybe 30 lakhs 40 lakhs okay so on a population of 130 35 crores of india that number was too small over the last 2 3 years this number has exploded and i will give thanks to this new technology kind of company where they have been able to attract new young people the number is right now the number is close to 20 million Uh, excluding the duplication, I think it will be around 13 to 15 million. Of course, the number has grown three times over the last four or five years. But I still, 15 million is still a very small percentage of the total population. These numbers, my feeling is, in the next five years, can still double from here. So, in a way, it is good. You know, earlier what used to happen is traditional brokers like us, me and you, used to get clients. Clients used to be Uh, do some trades with us, get understanding of the market, and then go and do with active brokers with for reduced rate. So we were actually the sourcing point through IPOs, and then maybe we were giving it to discount brokers, the so-called technology uh, platform. I think today that trend has reversed, and I am very happy about it. They are able to attract new clients to the market, and I am sure over a period of time, uh, uh, people will realize that. Uh, 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 trading actively doesn't mean making money. Investing, keeping, keeping hold the shares for a longer term is where you actually make money. So in a way, it is good for the industry. But I still feel that industry still has a long, long, long way to go. Satish, that's a great insight. I never thought of it like this. That they are actually acquiring customers, and finally, the customer retention will will happen with the guys who will actually provide value-added service. fantastic i think that's a that's a fantastic great insight uh you know but an, an interesting point that you made that these are largely uh very young guys and they have just started earning if you think about it a large part of them unless they have really had a inherited part of the wealth but that's that will be a very small minority right so a large part of these guys are have a, have a small small pool of money i would like to believe but when we talk about the the real big boys high net worth individuals clients right and they all come to a firm like yours right uh, where who provide a full service or a full advisory kind of thing and i must admit that actually uh, a firm like yours definitely is doing must be doing a great job and why i say that because when i see your numbers uh, uh, i think the recent numbers when i saw as a firm you probably done about 350 crores of top line and about 160 crores of pat now that's a very very decent profitability uh and even if i and i believe you have lot of and your balance sheet is very strong you have lot of cash but even if i have to adjust for some treasury income because of the uh you know because of the cash 
I, I would like to believe that your top line from the core business will be about 300 crores and a profit before tax of 100 crores. That's a very strong profitability. So my, the, the way I interpret is that obviously you are adding a lot of value to your customers, your HNIs. Uh, how, how do you do this and what is the secret? Can you share some bit of it? And how do you see it going forward? Uh, so Sachin, um, you know, we have this uh, motto, we have this uh, mission vision, what we say. We exist, we exist to help clients make better returns. That is, that is our saying. We exist to make our clients make better returns. If you are not able to do that, we don't need to be this industry. So we don't do proprietary trading. We prefer to push delivery business, which is where a larger percentage of our income comes in. Because we believe that only those disciplined delivery investors will make money. We have seen statistics. Unfortunately, most of the people who do day trading or for most of the people who do FNO, which is uh, which is a big craze uh, these days, over a period of time, a larger percentage, I don't want to put a number, I don't want to astonish people, a larger percentage to be safe to say that, loses money. Okay, And this is also coming from uh, this technology-based uh, uh, ex exposure we have had. Uh, clients, uh, this young client thinks that uh, by attending a week class or a two-week class, they understand the derivatives market um, and they start trading. But of course, actually, uh, you will come to only after a certain period of time that uh, only buying a call or put doesn't mean that uh, your risk is uh, covered. Yeah, of course, your risk is covered, but you still have to pay the premium for buying call and put. End of the year, how much have you paid for that? So those things are still to evolve. But why should somebody come to us? I mean, we are platform providers apart from the execution services. Why should somebody come to us or like people like uh, you? So they expect that we should be able to get them better returns than what they would normally get if they do it themselves. Okay. So we will, in terms of service, in terms of brick mortar branches, and in terms of advice, that this is the stock you need to buy. This is the stock you need to sell. And if you have bought the stock, this is what you look at in the long term. What we try to tell people is stock market is not for trading. It is for investments. You invest in stock market with a goal in mind. You have goals, five year goal, 10 year goal, 15 year goal. And I'm not talking only about directly secondary market. I'm talking about mutual fund as well. You invest with a goal in mind. And for that, you identify either a mutual fund scheme or a stock. If you are capable enough, if you have understanding, you, you buy those stocks which you understand. If you are not, you take advice from a reliable intermediary or you go to professional fund managers like yours and us. If you have a disciplined way of investment, I'm sure people will make money. So that is what even an HNI expects. Of course, an HNI requires a little bit more help rather, other than uh, a, a retail investor. You sometimes have to go and do the risk profiling. Main thing is asset allocation. The how much percentage of his asset is in uh, equities. Sometimes advice on tax planning, estate planning, and all those things. So all those gamut comes under actually a private wealth kind of a department. Hi, Satish. So I I completely understand what you say, uh, and I would like to second what you said that trading doesn't make money because for some, for a brief period of time I was also there on a trading desk, and I will tell you my number. You you did you you hesitated to mention your number. I can understand where you're coming from, but I'm no more associated with broking, so I'll tell you my number. And my number was that ninety percent of the people who were trading actually lost money. Uh, I'm sure your number is close to that number. It can't be very different. Uh, another important thing is. That is, it's really ironical that we being in the broking business, we tell our customers that don't do this because this is what makes money for us. And yet people still continue to do that. So that's a classic greed and fear thing that we go around. So yeah, thanks thanks for that insight. Because over to you. Satish, I was listening to you very closely. And I think in one of our earlier discussions, you mentioned a very interesting point about uh, mass wealth firm versus boutique firms. I think probably you may want to elaborate that further because I found that distinction very, very interesting. Uh, uh, thanks, Vikas. Um, 
so uh, like i said when you when you first mentioned brokerage i said don't mention brokerage it is investments the old age uh, 20 30 years back we could have been called brokerage now we are no longer a brokerage we provide all kind of solutions you starting you know financial planning starts with insurance that is the basic thing which somebody needs before coming to invest whether you have insured yourself for the sake of your family that is the first part the second comes is asset allocation what percentage of your asset is into equities you should not i mean there is no point putting 1% of your total portfolio into equities it going up by three times doesn't make any difference to your net worth you should have a, a proportionate to your risk appetite allocation to equities then only you'll make actually the gains which will help you in your future and the third is advice these are the three things uh, so what we call ourselves so we are a retail uh, intermediary we cater to in a year we are in contact with close to 400000 clients we call ourselves as mass wealth managers of course uh, wealth manager as not as per the sebi term uh, sebi has a <laughs> definition for sebi so i am not talking in 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 legal terms so we 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 try to explain to the client how a standardized way of making wealth and investment priorities so we like hnis you have a wealth management division or private wealth division so so as it called you advise clients on different different aspect inter, including international equities of course for retail on a standardized basis we don't advise on 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 international equities for retail clients but we try to bucket them with their risk profile okay this is your risk profile you could have this much percentage in equities whether it is secondary market or primary market is different this, this is what you need to have your insurance etc etc so we like to call ourselves uh, uh, trying to provide mass financial uh, i will not call the word management very interesting so my my next question actually uh, is something which came in from uh, quite a few uh, you know people who have been tracking you know the tweets and the social media thing there are two parts to this uh, first part is that uh, in today's world of complex financial products you actually mentioned international equity but i think that is far less complex than what we see around us people today are bombarded with a lot of information on cryptocurrency and you know, etfs different types of etfs uh, so a- as a as a firm how do you help your clients create wealth you know how do you keep them focused on uh, you said goal setting one part of it yes but i'm just saying that how do you cut out the noise and create wealth for your clients that is for one part of the question the second part of the question is a lot of clients uh, would come to you for creation of wealth through fno right uh, now obviously there is a discussion which just happened that you know, most of the people lose money but i'm sure that there would be a lot of people coming to you saying that markets look good i want to make money tell me so how do you advise these people uh, you want the money for fno but you don't want them to lose money so how do you weave that in into your entire uh, financial advice so two parts complex products how do you make sure that people stay focused on what they're doing rather than getting carried away by the noise and two is products like derivatives how do you weave them in so uh, uh, the first question itself i'll split into two parts uh, vikas hmm. uh, so for the mass retail you don't need complex products hmm. complex products is required for people uh, who are ultra hnis who has the appetite to take complex products 95 99% of uh, indians do not need complex products actually speaking they need only a disciplined way of investments either they do it themselves through an advice of a intermediary or they give it to professional fund managers what they need is discipline patience and goal setting let us forget asset allocation which has happened before this discussion has happened so what you are able to what you are able to tell your clients is the of course we start with history like i said in the beginning when i when i came to this industry it was 1000 today it is 53000 sensex without doing anything if you had bought the 30 good stocks you would have made 14% return plus the dividends every year it will be around 1.5 2% plus you don't need to do anything else what now we people like us have done is we choose out of this 30 stocks of 100 stocks or 200 stocks we choose out of this 200 300 mutual funds with basis some 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 advice some uh, some study that this could be the best mutual fund this could be the best stock for you for the next future 1 3 4 5 years 
plainly following that with a disciplined investment is enough for the mass retail. Yes. People who are able to take much better risk, people who like to diversify from from only this uh, plain vanilla product. These are these are called ultra HNIs who has the appetite to do this. We have a different department for that. It doesn't happen through the through the whole brick and model branch staff we have. We have a separate department like you have a department which manages HNI clients. There we have complex products. We have, we allow investing in, in in international stocks. We allow. I mean, we uh, it is okay for us to uh, ask people to invest in international mutual funds. Okay, so these are for a particular segment of people who are able to take risk, who wants to diversify their portfolio beyond India. So two separate separate set of people surveys them because it requires a little bit better uh, knowledge in terms of sales people also to understand these products. <coughs> to answer the second question, which is very interesting and which is little uh, sensitive for us, FNDO trading. You know, as a concept, FNDO was for hedging. Okay, because uh, uh, 300, 400 years ago, it started with cotton. So if you have something you want to hedge, you would do a derivatives. The idea was to hedge your existing portfolio. I don't know in this today's market, less than 1% of the total population would be hedging using FNDO for hedging. Balance uses it for uh, high frequency trading. I will not call gambling because it looks bad. <laughs> I, I am not sure uh, how many of them understand the nuances of derivatives trading. Mm. I don't think a one week, two week or a one month class is enough to teach people the nuances of derivatives trading. Mm. It is very simple for us to say, you buy a call, your risk is limited. You only lose the premium you have paid. Okay, very simple. I mean, yeah. I, uh, I I see a lot of youngsters coming to us saying that, oh, I trade in FNDO, but I don't take any risk. I have bought a nifty call by paying 100 rupees. I don't have any, I'll lose only 100 rupees, 100 rupees into the 50 market load, whatever. I said, come back to me after 12 months, how many such calls you have bought and how do the money you have paid? So people do not understand. I think my feeling, my personal feeling, H FNDO, derivatives trading is only for a certain class of people who understand. Rest of the people, unfortunately, over a longer term, have chances of losing money. So my request to all of you, all of the all of the new age clients would be, don't get into FNDO if you do not understand it. It's, it's, it's actually very interesting, you know, that uh, recommending FNO to an h &I investor for hedging. I think that's as candid as it gets. Uh, I, I remember one of your quotes, which I think you said somewhere and, you know, uh, maybe I, I read it somewhere. Very interesting, which has stayed with me. Ki stock satta nahi hota hai, position satta hota hai. Yeah. So I think that works not just for uh, FNO, but it also works for cash investing. Yeah. So stock satta nahi hota hai, position satta hota hai. Very interesting one. See, actually, because... Uh... Uh, I, I should not be saying this, but still I would like to say this, you know, greed in any form is harmful. Yeah. Greed in any form is harmful. You have a leverage trading in Infosys. I mean, Infosys is a very good company or any other such good scripts. You have a leverage trading, something bad happens, you lose money. You have not lost money because of Infosys. You yeah. lost money because of your greed. Okay, so there is, I mean, and unfortunately, what happens is uh, people lose money because of this reason, and they say the stock market is bad. Mm -hmm. They go and tell four other people the stock market is bad, and the four other people who have never invested in the stock market feels it is bad. Actually, if you had done the same thing in uh, horse racing or by playing poker, you would have get the, you would have got the same results. So I don't think uh, you should need to generalize uh, when your approach itself was wrong. Yes, absolutely. Right. Sajin? Yeah. So, you know, interesting point Satish you mentioned about the segmentation of people in terms of the HNI and the mass and what they should be doing. But, you know, again, in the recent times, what we are seeing is a 
is a new trend and what i call it something like a ikea trend ikea has come to india i see a lot of investors also coming into stock markets who are more like diy right the do it yourself and uh, you know they 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 are trying a lot of new things on their own uh, how do you see this trend and what would be your uh, you know thoughts to them in terms of how should they be managing things okay so uh, sachin before i answer your question you know there are some people uh, you know uh, i i rarely go to twitter but i see on twitter i made so much of money i made so much of money i don't think i have ever seen that i lost so much of money sir anybody saying that absolutely yes uh, so it it makes me feel that uh, 20 million people trading in the stock market everybody is making money by trading i don't think uh, uh, that is that is correct uh, so and uh, most of this uh, new gen people are tech savvy they are uh, definite followers of uh, twitter and all those things which vikas uses i don't use <laughs> uh, so they feel that uh, they can do it yeah but there are certain segment uh, segment of people segment of clients new age new age uh, gen clients also who are able to understand the market and take appropriate decision but a large percentage 90 95% plus i don't think they have reached the stage of do it yourself but yes they would like to do it and i think in life everything should be experimented only only if you do it you will know that you don't you are not able to do it right so let people let people train let people do it themselves over a period of time they will understand whether they are right or there are expert people in this business whom they should refer to but this is come and tell me you know uh, people come and tell me that uh, okay i would like to trade because because they have heard their neighbors making money they have heard vikas as they were saying on twitter that i made money by trading so people come and tell me that i would like to trade um, first thing is i try to find out what is their experience in trading how do how much do they understand either fundamentals or technicals i try to we try to discourage them but still yes they would still like to trade you know you tell somebody not to do it they would first want to do it then say okay <coughs> so what i tell them is uh, okay you want to trade but give me a discipline you will use maybe 5% or 10% of a portfolio for trading and if you are able to make money fine then you are a better person than what i thought but if you are losing if you lose that your cap of 10% don't come to trading go and do investments so we though what though no matter what we tell our clients that don't do trading they'll still trade and some people make money also there are learned invest investors somebody who understand technical analysis there are some people who make money and i would like everybody of our clients to make money but lot percentage doesn't so what i advise them is you allocate a certain portfolio certain percentage of a portfolio there you take risk you do whatever you want to do the moment you finish that you understand uh, which side of the uh, coin you are but satish in the last 30 years that you've been around uh are you seeing this as a new trend that when investors are joining the and entering the stock markets they want to do it themselves or earlier because i believe most of the people would go to a broker even a neighbor who's a broker and tell them what do you think i should do buy sell this is probably for the first time that we are seeing this is a uh, where they you know it's a, it's a diy generation would you would you agree with that or you've seen this in the past too you know uh, my form. feeling is uh, sachin my feeling is diy was there prevalent prevalent sometime back also so okay. clear why doesn't mean that you only choose. you actually are speaking to somebody on twitter vikas sachdev was actually saying that i made money in xyz script okay so that's whether vikas sachdev has made that money right okay so some some sort of that was there some years back also today because of technology that number okay. has largely largely increased okay and Got you it. have seen this case in us how some retail investors have taken one of two of scripts to whatever level they could take right. so that is the kind of strength but uh, advice is it doesn't happen always true just a clarification guys vikas sachdev never proclaims he made money on twitter <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry, sorry. laughs> i was about to make that comment for all those people in compliance listening to this i said i take compliance permission but it's okay it's just i was just smiling to myself 
Vikas, you don't know. You only got a one million followers now because you're making money. Satish has made you more famous. I made more money because I listened to Satish and I invest. Sachin and I invest in his funds. Because I don't trade. I can't trade. Compliance restrictions for us is very very huge. But I think what Satish is trying to label is a point of people who are trying to use that social media platform. Because I said clarify, no, it is not Vikas. But I have a name there which I cannot tell on this forum. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. <laughs> okay, let's let's just. I, I'm going to take a small, small, uh, you know, change of topic. In the sense, Satish, uh, you know, your firm has a very, very strong presence uh, in the in the Middle East markets, uh, and also a lot of remittances. The largest remittances comes to your state, where where you are based out of. As a, as a, I mean, you're, you're spread across the country, but which is where your uh, foundation or where your HQ is. uh how do you see these nri investors what is their profile what are their expectations what are their goals are they different from us residents how, can you can you define this nri uh as a customer okay. or an investor so uh sachin uh, when i talk about our clients uh most of our nris come from the gulf side of the world traditionally you know a lot of malayalis went to gulf uh, right. some years back to make money and so on so the cult increased and there are a lot of uh, uh, south indians there in the gulf side so and we have offices there through our joint ventures in in most of the gulf countries and there also there are two segments of clients one is the mass retail who sends a certain amount of money every month to his family back in uh, kerala and the set, the second second the high paying uh, uh, work high paying uh, jobs in nris who are well educated and they have other avenues other than india also so let me talk about the first portion which is where the mass retail of nris is their goals are not largely different from what a normal resident indian does first is of course they have to buy a place where they have to stay second they want to secure their future because the disposable income is better than a normal resident indian they are able to invest in markets whether it is direct stock market or in mutual funds thankfully in spite of the rupee depreciating over the last 2 3 years they have not affected because 99% of them do not repatriate the money okay so so what they have to invest now they are actually well off okay in terms of because they don't repatriate the one segment which is hni which invest in indian market also but they would like to diversify like our ultra hni clients they have exposure in international markets also so there you have a different set of rules and advice okay so for the the larger number of clients their goals are similar first is they want a house back in their hometown they will remit money back to india or kerala which will take care of their future for them the process remain the same for the ultra hni of course the process is little different nris nris are you know and primarily from the gulf in the last 1 2 years there has been uh, there has been some uh, 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 some impact because of this covid because of uh, loss of jobs there is some impact on the remittances over the last one year but not largely a problem as of now yeah but i guess with the oil prices coming back it yeah. should it should revive right absolutely absolutely right. yeah vikas over to you uh interesting that you mentioned <laughs> that you were talking about uh, nris building a house so i just want to pick that question up these are last couple of questions before i go to the audience questions there uh so for for an nri investor both the classes which you talked about you know people who are quite sophisticated in the knowledge and people who are not uh, in terms of their allocation between uh, physical and financial assets do you see a difference uh, that is part a and part b is uh, although you've answered that but in context of physical and financial uh, do you see local and international asset diversification so uh, when you talk about the mass uh, Mass, I would say that still a larger, larger percentage goes into physical assets. Okay, in India. In India, and a smaller percentage to financial assets. 
Mm-hmm. Even in financial asset, a larger percentage goes to fixed income like FDs and bank. So uh, my my presumption is it number would be slightly better than a normal resident Indian who invests maybe five percent. For non-resident Indian, it could be around eight to ten percent. Just a just a ballpark figure. For those well-informed uh, NRIs, we have seen uh, well-informed NRIs up to 20-25% of their investable surplus are can be put in international markets also. Okay. But when you're saying international markets there, it is usually financial or they also invest in real estate overseas? It is primarily financial. Primarily. You know, most, of, most of Indians uh, uh, most of Indian prefer to have a place in their local town rather than anywhere else in the world. Only those sophisticated uh, NRIs who wants to diversify would have investment outside India and maybe particularly uh, whether when it uh, helps them to take a visa, uh, you know, the, in this Gulf places. Interesting. So I think uh, last question before I lead on to audience questions, maybe the one before last, uh, you talked about fixed deposits. I just heard you mention about fixed deposits and a lot of time we had chatter about NRIs, uh, you know, looking at opportunities where they made money through leveraging and investing in fixed income instruments. Uh, globally. Uh, Do you think that is something which is a sizable part of an NRI's wealth management or money money wealth creation uh, uh, process? Uh, Because this happens during certain periods of the industry. You know, uh, if if you look at, I think, uh, eight, ten years back, uh, uh, you know, we had we had uh, we had actual examples where uh, uh, people used to deposit, uh, make an FD in their uh, in their Gulf Bank, take uh, five times, three times leverage. Yeah, yeah uh, Put yeah. that money into Indian FD. Uh, the loss in foreign exchange was not much. Net to net, net to net, they still made gains. My personal uh, opinion about this, I would prefer, as far as possible, not to be leveraged, mm-hmm. because leverage, leverage always has a problem of uncertainty. Mm. Something wrong happens, the leverage itself, the principle itself can go. This is only for informed investors or investors who have access to good wealth managers. If they are able to do that, it is good. But for the mass, I would always prefer to be non-leverage, particularly in equity. I will never advise anybody to invest in equities by taking a leverage. leverage. Yes. It is, I mean. it is a very, very wrong thing to do investing in equity by taking loan funds. It can Absolutely. create chaos. No, it's probably a shadow way of looking at, uh, you know, an FNO trade in a way. You know, you're leveraging on your bets and you're doing that. Sizing is an issue. Yeah, it's still slightly different. It's slightly different, I've seen conceptually. Slightly different uh, because with FNO, you're putting your own money. So it is okay. But if you take a loan, Yes. And do it. Yes. You know, the markets in the short term can do anything. Yes, you're right. So, it will right. be a little careful. I will never advise anybody to take a loan and buy equities. Wonderful. So, my last question is actually dovetailing into into uh, the audience questions. But before that, Sankalpa, I saw a poll which you ran in which 91% of the people said that they have not made money in derivatives, right? There are a lot of polls, so we can discuss them in a while after we've taken the questions. <laughs> Satish, uh, before we move on, because with your, uh, you know, I just want to ask one question. You said never borrow to buy equities. Okay, but these days, what are, what is happening as a trend is that people borrow against equities. You know, your lap or you know, loan against shares. That has that has and that has become increasingly very popular. Okay, but the caveat here is that your collateral itself will shift its value depending on the market and it has you know led to huge margin calls which we have seen across different cycles there was a there was one in 18 19 20 would have probably seen some cycles so what is your advice on those kind of you know that's also an investment product at the end of the day if you want to dip into your mutual fund and borrow against it so what will you you know what is your view there so again i'll go back to my old statement uh I will advise people not to do it, okay, but still people would want to do it. So then I will say that, okay, you want to borrow, you borrow up to 10% of your portfolio. Then you keep a stop loss. If this is over, 
they will not do that okay so ultimately you know equity market nobody can guarantee anything can happen in the short term you know one fine day something happens you have seen you know particularly in pharma stocks one fdi fda audit comes in the pharma stocks can tank normally what happens is that you have taken loan on a pharma stock to buy a pharma stock so you have double impact you know it is always preferred preferable to use your own money to trade for long term that is where you make money in this mark in this industry for 30 years i have seen quite a few people who are active traders who move out of the market in one year two year three year depending upon how good they are but i have seen many many investors over the last 10 20 30 years who have been long term investments and they are still there in the market you know this is pretty insightful when you were talking again i was smiling to myself because you sounded like when i talk to my son you know better drinking is not good for health but if you still insist on drinking drink with me <laughs> at least <laughs> i'll control where it goes so thank you that was very interesting so talking about uh, stock markets a plethora of questions which are coming on the stock market satish and uh, you know if if there is any disclaimer or anything which you would want to do before you answer any of these questions please feel free to but most of these are general questions and i'm just dovetailing into that because the question i had is uh, why should nra investors look at indian markets today given that international markets have done very well but whatever i'm think i'm seeing a lot of questions coming in on what is your outlook on indian markets at current stage okay uh, because uh... i told you uh, in the beginning when i came to this market in 1990 index was 1000 now it's 53000 which is 14% cagr and uh, it, it actually uh, blends into the kind of growth india had in terms of nominal gdp over the last uh, uh, 30 odd years more or less 14% nominal growth and 14% growth in uh, the index this is index if you had put in a mutual fund a, a high performing mutual fund instead of 14 you would have got 18 20% if you had the apt, at aptitude or research advice from somebody in a good stock maybe it would have been 20 to 25% also but let us for this basis of the discussion let us limit up to the lowest denominator which is the indian economy returns of 14% india is growing i feel in the next 10 15 20 years india will still grow at 10% nominal growth and i feel that kind of return should be ex- should be an expectable return in the market can you just repeat that again please uh, you are saying what is the expectation the expected return 10 to 12% over the next 10 years and okay. as in when as in how india becomes a developed country the rate of uh, the nominal growth rate comes down of course the inflation ob- obviously will come down we will still make a net return in equities compare this with us if this rule holds good here i am sure this rule should hold go- good in other countries also where they are great gro- growing at 4 or 5% return so i am very bullish on india 100% of my equities and my advice is to all clients like this only that i believe returns in india would over a longer term the next 10 15 years be the best one of the best among all developed countries you said that there is a trend you know last year or a year and a half uh, nasdaq gave so much of returns where india has not given that kind of returns of course there are cases and these aberrations happens once once upon, once upon a time what what has moved in uh, these uh, indices particularly technology stocks if you were or if i was uh, that inclined that i knew the technology stock was going up in us i would have found out some such stocks in india which would have, which would have gone up by 50 60% over the last one year so there is no dearth of opportunities if you have the aptitude to study it yourself or if you have a help from a, a informed a reliable intermediary you can actually make that kind of return but when i say something it is for the larger mass who do not have access to these people it is better to put in mutual fund i'm sure over a, my my personal feeling over a longer period returns in india would be one of the best 
In fact, I remember a discussion with you sometime back when I countered this by saying that there are industries like robotics and uh, artificial intelligence which you can encash in the US. And you promptly came back and said that that may be the case there. But in India also, you have industries at the nascent stage like specialty chemicals, which you may not be getting to access at this stage anyway. So I think that's a, that's a valid <laughs> argument uh, to look at investing in India. Uh, uh, and there is another question. I'm trading on eggshells. This is by Subankar Chakraborty. I'm trading on eggshells because it is somewhat about my industry as well. Uh, it says, I'm an invest investment advisor and I want to uh, enc I encounter this question very often. How effective are complicated financial models and AI strategies in terms of generating returns that beat the regular MS strategies, which are so diversified nowadays? What is the inv incentive for investing this huge lump sum in relatively complicated instruments? So Satish, before you answer, if I can just uh, talk about it, uh, you know, it is the same perception is reality in the absence of communication. So Shubankar, I must tell you that, uh, you know, especially the products which Sachin handles, uh, these are all long only. There is no hedging, no derivatives, nothing. Uh, we run it in a very different way. That is the reason why we call the alternates business. Uh, the portfolios are concentrated. The risk management is more stringent. But the idea is to give better returns over a period of time to savvy investors more than what mutual funds do. Uh, mutual funds, of course, are the bellwether. I spent my entire career in mutual funds, so I know what you're talking about. But the word complicated is not necessarily for a large swath of products, which is long only. There are AI strategies which do get into hedging, we do get into leveraging and all of that. I think that is probably what you're referring to, which is where I'll now pass it on to Satish uh, to answer this question. Uh, you know, uh, Vikas, you, you know, you mentioned that I don't lose my cool. Okay. Uh, I don't know how far it is true, but I think it is true. You know why? Because right. I don't get into complicated products. Something which I don't understand, I don't advise. For that, I, I rely on people like you who run this private wealth, who have a uh, well-informed research team and all those people who can advise. If you have uh, somebody, good advisor like uh, uh, you people, or you, know, you can come to Georgit also. We have also have a division like that. So I will not let you alone take that uh, cream. Only those people also, I would always prefer that as a client, I would understand after under I will invest only after understanding the risk involved. Understood. I am a simple man. I don't understand. If I don't understand, I will not invest in complex products. Period. No, I think you're right. I think uh, being simple is the most complex thing, like they say. Right. So I think this is very well put. And uh, just for everybody's this thing that if Satish asks me a question, I will tell him personally, not on Twitter. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a light I mean. uh, Now. Archit Maria has been asking questions. So I think this is a question for both you and you, Satish and Sachin, if you'd like to chip in. Uh, the whole idea, the whole question which Archit is asking me again and again through different uh, uh, points of view is view on the banking sector. He's also asked me about some stocks in banking, but I would rather give uh, for the sake of the audience a uh, view from both of you on the banking sector. This is probably the only sectoral question which has come to me so far. And it's coming to me quite a few times. So I think people are keen to know. Uh, Satish, Sachin, over to you. Uh, sorry, I will not get into sector wise. I don't know. Uh, we have a huge compliance issue. So I will not reply on uh, stocks. I really don't understand these things. I, re I give this uh, question to people more educated, more informed, more educated than me. I think Sachin will be better, better place to answer this. Satish, I wouldn't say that I'm more educated or more informed, but it's my job to say, so I'm going to say this. Yeah, but uh, so let's just you know, point out a very uh, blunt disclaimer that this is for educational purpose, which, uh, you know, let's take care of all our compliances. This is more educative than advisory. So please do consult your financial advisor before taking any actionables. Over to you, Sachin. And Sachin does not advise this even on Twitter. He has a Twitter handle. He doesn't advise that. So you have to log in here and find out. Sachin, <laughs> that's an over to you. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So, you know, uh, you know, banking as a space is clearly a very, very high potential as far as growth is concerned, uh, simply because, you know, uh, banking is the backbone of any economy. And as Satish mentioned earlier also, that if we are positive on the Indian economy uh, and the Indian stock market respect the most where there is growth, Indian economy is all about growth. So banking as a sector uh, will definitely do very, very good. And most another very important thing is in terms of the penetration. Today, 
you look at you look at any products uh you know satish mentioned about the broking penetration but even if you look at the housing loan kind of penetration if you look at the auto loans if you look at personal loans uh the kind of the sme sector that we are going to see that's going to actually explode i i use the word explode in the next 10 years uh you know and so from all of that perspective i think uh the opportunity is really really large the other very important thing is that the banks have really evolved uh some of the large banks have become one of the most tech savvy uh, companies i think they are actually becoming more technology companies uh, because as far as banking is concerned they've got everything in place they have been doing this for down few years uh they've got their uh disciplines they've got the risk management all of that absolutely in place it's now just about you know go to market in the most efficient way reaching out to the right uh, set of customers uh and they 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 are they are actually uh i would say ruthlessly uh you, you know using technology to 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 achieve these goals uh, so from that perspective we we strongly believe that banking as a sector uh will do very very well over the next 5 to 10 years of course uh, there are there are a few trends there for example uh we saw that in the last 10 years the the private sector has gained humongous amount of market share over the public sector uh again within the uh, all the players the top 5 or top 10 players have actually gained even more uh, uh market share compared to the other players uh, so i think the important thing here is uh, to figure out some of these trends uh, going forward and we strongly believe that uh, the the probably the large will get even larger and stronger uh, 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 in the next 5 to 10 years thank you sachin uh there is an observation and there's a counter observation which is coming to your comment on derivatives satish uh, kashyap jagari mentions that uh, is there anything wrong in recommending hnis to hedge via fnu bill ackman didn't sell any shares during covid 19 pandemic but made a lot of money spending 27 million buying option in feb march 2020 okay so and the counterpoint to this from a very different space very very different space is uh, is subankar chakravarti who says that i can share the result of my experiment in trading and fnu when i used to be an engineer by profession first two weeks i made 20000 odd and then the following monday i lost 15000 odd then i realized the difference between trading and investing and started my investment journey in april 2008 uh, now i'm an investment advisor so i think uh, the observation here is uh, something which uh, i learned from the late uh, parag parik uh, and that got reinforced in my stint during mutual funds as well says like investing you know when you're investing in stocks uh, you should always know that it's like you're you're dealing in fire uh, fire can actually cook food for you if it is handled well or it can burn your house down if you take too many liberties with it so i think the statement is that if you know how to handle things if you're very well aware of the risk you're very knowledgeable yes you can very well be the 1% of the people who make money but for a large swath of people i don't think that holds water so i i thought this was a very interesting observation in fact uh, satish Well, Lalit V has asked whether he can be a client of yours. So, Lalit, you could just write down, uh, write it to uh, PMS AF World or us, and we will forward your query to uh, to to uh, Geojit. Uh, I don't know whether you would like to answer this last question, Satish. Uh, is your view on this whole incident of delisting of shares and people starting to take tax shelter? DHFL video call on Lakshmi Vilas Bank. Would you like to comment on that? That is a question just coming from Varun Prasad. so uh it will be a general answer i will not talk about specific scripts <clears throat> uh, hindsight it looks like it was a wrong decision uh, to buy these kind of shares uh, if you made a wrong decision in life you have to pay for it uh, if if a regulator provide some way out yes be happy and take it otherwise you make a wrong decision you pay for it so that is why you say don't put all your eggs in one basket so whenever you do uh, uh, when you have to do a portfolio allocation after the asset allocation you invest only a certain percentage of your asset in one stock and it's good possible that your decision goes wrong there is nothing wrong in it uh, you know generally when i speak about uh, portfolio if you have 10 stocks a um, couple of stocks will not do well five or six stocks will do according to the indices and two stocks will be multi baggers that is how you make your return so there could be one wrong decisions in your portfolio and you have to bear it uh, you buy 10 stocks nobody in this world 
can say that 10 out of the 10 is multi bag it never happens like that so once wrong decision you made you learn next time don't try to make that same mistake very true so before i hand it over back to sankarpa i think uh, two things uh, we have to announce the best question and i think the question which made me chip in and step in because of the sharpness and the uh, candidness of the question by subankar chakravarti talking about pms in aif and how it is differential and how it's complicated satish if it's okay with you i think we can award him the best prize although i loved kashyap's observation but unfortunately it was an observation it was not a question otherwise if it was framed as a question i would have probably considered that uh, subankar congratulations and sankarpa there's a compliment for you and the pms ai world team they said that uh, rahul chadda who's one of our most regular viewers i said he just loved the way we managed the technical glitch yeah thank you chadda ji <laughs> i hope few of them occur okay. over to sankarpa so uh, thank you ladies and gentlemen for tuning in today i think this was a very inf- informative session and thank you satish i think you know uh, it is very rare that we get someone of your wisdom and vintage coming here and talking to us about uh, you know investing and uh, trading also so candidly so i thank you uh, from the team at pmsi f world to the audience uh, we are ever so grateful for your con- continuous support and uh, your uh you know a patronage to us i hope uh, you subscribe to our youtube channel and uh, you know visit our website and look at all the amazing work they, we have done uh, we also invite you all to our uh, you know mid year event with event which is scheduled on the 9th and 10th of july this is going to be a unique format where fund managers ask real questions to fund managers you know it's going to be an exciting journey thank you vikas thank you sachin uh you know you you've gotten your uh you know you've added much flavor to this interaction today and i think from your uh, collective wisdom our audience is also get a lot of uh, you know their questions their perspectives cleared so thank you everybody we hope to meet soon i wish everybody a very healthy uh, you know uh, a healthy monsoon and everybody stay safe uh, thank you Thank you. Thank you, you Sadhish. Thank you, Sankarpo. Thank you, Vikas. Thank you, Vikas. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a nice evening. Thank Thank you. you. Take care. Bye-bye.